All right, good morning, teachers and students. Welcome to today's episode of Museum Mysteries. Uh, and we are still in Hispanic Heritage Quarter. Uh, so we're talking about the early Spanish explorers and, and settlers in Florida. When you read about history in the United States, most of the time throughout much of the country, you're reading about English settlers, pilgrims, um, Jamestown, Williamsburg, Charleston, uh, places like that, um, Plymouth Rock. And so most of the country besides Florida was settled by English settlers. Um, some French in, in, in different parts of the country, but in Florida, we're different. Everybody knows we're different in Florida, right? So in Florida, the English did not necessarily uh, stay in Florida. They tried, they tried to stay for a while, but the Spanish were the first to arrive, the Spanish and the French. And the Spanish kicked the French out pretty early. And for the last 500 years, uh, Florida has been a mix of people from all over the world. Uh, and that started pretty early. So we all know that there were Native Americans here uh, living in Florida when the first Spanish explorers arrived. Those in this part of Florida, we, uh, we call those Indians Tumuquin Indians. And that's a word that was recorded by, uh, written down uh, by early Spanish explorers. They, they were able to, to communicate, talk back and forth with the Native Americans and they wrote down uh, the name of the tribe. And so in this part of Florida, we, they were called Tamuquin people. And um, that has to uh, do with today's museum mystery object. Um, so we know about 500 years ago, the, the Spanish arrived. Now, when they arrived, they brought all kinds of new things with them. They brought horses and cows and pigs. In fact, wild pigs in Florida, they're not even really wild, they're escaped pigs, but guess who they escaped from about 500 years ago? Spanish explorers. So we have, we have pigs, chickens, um, sheep, horses, cattle, metal. The Native Americans didn't have metal like steel and iron and things like that. They didn't have it. Um, they didn't have the wheel. They didn't have wagons and carts. So the Spaniards brought all these new things, a new religion, Catholicism. We talked about that couple weeks ago with the Spanish mission bell. And um, these two very, very different groups of people met and, and traded ideas and sometimes fought. And um, uh, it didn't end well for the Native Americans. The Spaniards brought new diseases with them uh, that the Native Americans had never uh, been exposed to. And, and many of them, uh, most of them passed away from epidemics and there was a lot of warfare and fighting going on. But anyway, one of the most interesting and important things that Spaniards brought has to do with this week's museum mystery object. And to be fair, today's museum mystery object is actually two objects, but they go together. So they're a set. We're going to just refer to them as, as one, even though they're two. It's a trick. So today's museum mystery object are these two things that go together as a set. And if you had a chance to print your worksheets, teachers, it's okay if you did it, but this just gives the students an extra place to, to gather information. You'll see a little sketch of the object there, and I'm going to describe it. Uh, first of all, this piece is probably pretty obvious to most of you uh, in terms of what it is. It's white, it's very lightweight, it's hollow. It's like a hollow tube with some fluffy stuff here. So we're gonna talk about that in just a second, but that's the first museum mystery object. And notice it has a sharp point here. The sharp point and the hollowness are important. Now, here's the other part of the, the mystery object. It looks like a little weird coffee cup or something. And it's made out of brass, it's metal. It has a solid bottom and a little lid where you can close the top or you can open it. And so it's obviously a container, right? But what were they doing with these two things? So teachers, I'm going to have you let your students discuss this for a few minutes. Let's uh, record a few things that they notice about these two objects and maybe some questions. And why is this important to Spanish 
history in Florida, Hispanic history. Why, why in the world are we looking at these two things when we're talking about Spanish explorers? And what do they have to do with the Native Americans? So let's have your teacher, let's have your students talk about that just a few minutes, maybe not even that long, and send me some chats. Tell me what you think about this thing or these two things that make one thing. Let me know what you think. I'd like to know what you've noticed about them and what you think they're for. So teachers, if you send me those in chat, we can discuss and then I'll tell you more about these objects. All right, we have our first hypothesis coming in, our first theory says, we think it's something Native Americans may have used to draw or write with. Well, it is from that early time period, um, but the Native Americans did not have writing. They, uh, with a few exceptions, you know, down in Central America, the Mayan Indians had um, uh, glyphs, little pictures that they would, that they used in substitute of words, almost like uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So the Mayan Indians down in Central America had a written language, but the rest of the Indians across North America, certainly in Florida, they did not have reading or writing. So it does have to do with writing, but it's not Native American. All right, I see another comment. The hollow part was used to hold ink and the sharp point was used to write with. That is exactly right. But what is this? The container would hold ink. I see another comment, that's good. So we know that this held the ink and this was used to write the ink. But what is this? What do you think this is? What's this white thing made out of? We know that this is brass, but who can tell me what this is? Let's see some chat. It's a feather, absolutely right. It's a bird feather, very good. And it's a special kind of bird feather. It comes from a certain bird and a certain part of the bird because you wanted a long, stiff feather with a nice hollow tube uh, that you could turn into a quill pen. This is called a quill pen. So a feather can be referred to as a quill. And in fact, the quill is the hard hollow part, but this is a quill pen. And sometimes they would even trim all of the feather off and you would just be left with this hollow tube. Now, the Romans figured out that you could use hollow reeds, little wooden reeds, almost like little tiny pieces of bamboo, and they would dip those things in ink and write. But about 1500 uh, years ago, just after the Romans, during the Middle Ages, people got the idea to use quills to make pens. Now, back to the Spanish. The Spanish brought reading and writing to the New World. From the Old World, from Spain to North America, they brought reading and writing. And why is this so important to Florida history and to uh, Spanish uh, Heritage Month, which was last month, but we're in the quarter. So um, why is this important to Florida? Well, remember the Native Americans did not have reading and writing. So uh, the Tamuquins would pass down their legends and their stories and their history through stories and legends and myths that would get passed down from one generation to the next. Your, your, your great grandparents would tell your grandparents and they would tell your parents and so on down the line. And then you would get these stories and you would pass them on to the next generation. And that's how the history uh, was passed down. It's called oral history, it's spoken. So in places where they didn't have reading or writing, this was how people uh, recorded, sometimes through paintings. But when the Spanish arrived, they bring the quill pen and guess what? And this is where it's really lucky for guys like me who are history buffs, they start writing things down. They're writing down the things they're seeing and Florida was no exception. And in fact, they kept very, very good notes. They would have made excellent students. They would write down everything. They would write down who they met, what they looked like, what they were doing, how much money they were spending, what they needed, what they brought from Spain, what they were taking back to Spain. They kept records. It was like almost like a governmental office where they were writing everything down. So in Florida, oh, here's the best part. They took, this is really cool. They took all those documents with them. Now we're talking, well, they showed up about 500 years ago. So in the 1600s, 400 years ago, 
They're writing this stuff down. Guess what they do with it? They take it back to Spain and they stick it in a library. And you can still go to the library today. It's called the, uh, the Spanish Archives and it's, in a, and it's in a Spanish city called Seville. And there's also some old documents in Cuba. They brought these documents to libraries and they stuck them on a shelf and left them there. So historians can still go to libraries today and read the original Spanish documents about what was happening in Florida four or 500 years ago. And it's fascinating because otherwise, how would we know that that stuff happened? It's a great historical resource and it's a primary resource. Remember, this is actually an original. So I'm going to show you this up close. This is an original document and I have it written down. It's from the 1760s. And so this part up here is a stamp. Uh, Charles III was the king of Spain at that time. So this is the official government stamp of Charles III. That's how we know uh, how old it is because he was in power. Uh, he was the king from 1759 to 1788. So I think this is 1760s. But this is a document from a court case about somebody's property. They're arguing about who owns what. And look at the handwriting. This is done with a quill pen. It's very fancy. It's not like pens today. The paper was hard to get. So you see how they used most of the paper and they put some cool little designs. I don't know what this thing means, but it's probably somebody's little signature or design. So it's kind of like that old writing you'll see on the De Declaration of Independence, which was signed with quill pens. But this is an original document made with a quill pen from Spain. Okay. So the inkwell, you had to keep your ink in something, right? And ink was hard to get. You didn't want it to dry out. It's like paint, okay? And inkwells could also be glass. In fact, this one has ink in it. And in a few minutes, we'll test this out. And if I'm lucky, I won't have black ink all over myself. So we'll see how it works. But I wanna read you something interesting about quill pens. I looked up quill pens and here's what I found. Thomas Jefferson, who was one of the uh, founders of the United States, um, Thomas Jefferson kept special geese to use for writing implements because of the quill pens. Because of their shape, only the five feathers at the tip of the left wing could be pens for left-handers. So <clears throat> the left-handers would use the feathers from the right wing, and it was best to pull the feathers in the spring. Now, you didn't have to kill the, the goose. You could just capture it, pull the feathers out. It wouldn't be very happy, but you could turn it loose. And then the next spring, you would get some more pens off that uh, goose wing. So after you pulled the feathers, you would bury the tips of the feathers in hot, dry sand to make the points of the feathers hard, because you want this part hard. Then you would take a little knife and you would trim it to a, a point. And so um, after the, the Zoom, you guys could probably even experiment. I know that some students did this last week. They took straws, drinking straws, and they experimented with making their own quill pens and you could water down some paint and um, see how it works. So they, they cut it to a point and then there's a little split on the end. And teachers, you can find uh, little YouTube tutorials about how to make your own quill pen pretty easily. So I want to show you all a quick PowerPoint with some more images, and then we will test the quill pen, and then we can do questions and answers and, and see if you guys have any ideas or any questions that I can help you with. So I'm sharing the screen real quick here, and let's see. All right, <clears throat> so here's a picture of a fancy quill pen. Most of the time, as I said earlier, they would take a lot of the feather off. And you'll see that in a few photographs. This is kind of like a Hollywood stunt pen. It's not necessarily how they might've looked, but it's close. Okay, this is a great painting. This is a painting of a person called a scribe. And a scribe was a person who could read and write and would take records and, and make books and things like that. But if you look closely in this painting, you'll see the scribe hard at work at his desk. This is probably somewhere in Europe. Oh, maybe around the year 12 or 1300. It's, it's pretty early. It's during the Middle Ages. You can tell by the, the clothes this gentleman's wearing. Um, but he is holding a quill pen 
And if you look down here on the edge of his desk, you can see little ink containers, right? And up here on the wall, it looks like some more ink containers and a few more quill pens sitting around on a shelf. And he has these books that he works on. And so in these days, not very many people could read and write. There were only certain folks who could read and write. A lot of times they were priests or monks or government officials. And those were the folks who would uh, write things down, make books, stuff like that. So this is a scribe hard at work with his quill pen. All right, here's a close up of that document that I just showed you. And you can see the fancy cursive writing with the quill pen. And if you look like down here, you'll see kind of a glob. That's where they probably pushed a little too hard and a little extra ink came out. You could control how thick the line was by how much pressure you put on the pen. So here you see uh, the person using the pen pushed a little bit harder to make a nice thick line. And they did that as, as part of the decoration. But that's one of the neat things about these quill pens is you can control how thick or thin the line is. All right, here is our friend, the goose. And we are talking about these feathers out here on the very tip of the wing. Uh, the, the last five or six feathers out here are evidently the best feathers for making quill pens. I will warn you though, that geese bite. So if you decide to try this on the weekend, please don't call the museum on Monday if you have uh, been bitten by a goose. I would not recommend trying to pull feathers out of a goose. I'm sure that there is a technique uh, but I don't know it. So don't try this at home. All right, here are some of the quill pens. There's six of them there. Or those are feathers to be turned into quill pens. Okay, these are actual quill pens. And you see the little numbers on them. Those are numbers that the museum put on them to keep track of them. These are probably hundreds of years old. And uh, they're like uh, library books. So that if the pen gets, if this little pen gets separated from its box of other pens, they know um, where it goes. And in fact, if you look at the, you see the number on the box, 37502, and here's a number on the, the this pen, 37502-1, that means that uh, this pen goes in that box. That's how museums keep track of where to keep stuff, a lot like library books. But these are actual pens. You can see the black ink on the tips. A couple of them have not been used, and some of them have been. And these little tips would wear out. You would have to retrim these with a little pen knife. All right, here's a close up of some, some tips. I think only one of them has been used. It's got some staining. The rest of them look pretty new. Okay, and the ink pots, the ink wells. Um, here is the, one of those glass ink wells. And then on the right, these are actually uh, ceramic uh, or they're fired clay, you know, like a coffee mug. And they come in different shapes and sizes. You can see this one is shaped like a little pyramid, that would help it to keep from tipping over. Because you could imagine that would be a disaster if this thing tipped over on your desk, there'd be ink everywhere and it would ruin your work. Okay, so that is our slideshow. And I am going to go back to full screen here. All right, we're going to, we're going to test this, this pen out and I'm going to do my best not to get ink all over me. Uh, but I have an old piece of paper and I have signed my name with this modern pen. Um, during the 1800s, they, they shifted away from feather pens, from quill pens, and they, they made the same shape out of metal and they started using uh, metal um, quill pens that they would dip in ink, uh, but they stopped using feathers, the metal would last longer. Um, and then, gosh, I don't know, 1900s, they started making pens like this. So it hasn't been very long ago people were using these pens. Um, okay, so I've got my ink. I'm going to very carefully take the cork out. You can see the cork has black ink on it. I've got a little paper towel over here. I'm going to set these things on. And here's the tricky part. I'm going to dip the quill into the ink. The ink goes up inside the 
uh, feather, the hollow part of the feather. And you can see some of it dripping out. This is what makes me nervous. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got, we've got some ink in the quill and I'm just going to see if I can write my name. I've got to hold it up so gravity will pull the ink down. Now it's already running out of ink. So I've got to dip it again. Almost like using a paintbrush. We'll go back over this so it's nice and dark. And I'll put a little swirly at the bottom. Now look at that. You would have to practice with one of these to make letters and words as graceful as this. But for a guy living in Ocala in the year 2021 who really doesn't know too much about quill pens, this came out okay. You could write a letter to one of your friends or you could write down some stories or you could even do some homework with one of these quill pens if you had to, but it would take a while. So before I forget, I'm going to put the cork back into the ink pot because that is very important. And I'll get the excess ink off the pen so I can use it next time. And you can see it's got the stains of the black ink on the pen, just like the old ones. So that's today's museum mystery object. And it has to do with Florida history because it allowed those Spanish um, newcomers to Florida to write down what they saw and to make observations and, and first person primary accounts of, of what was happening in Florida 500 years ago. If they wouldn't have written those things down, um, and I'm talking about how many people were here, what the, the Native Americans, what they looked like, where they were settling, the problems that they had. Um, so this really helps us to understand Florida history. If they would not have written those things down, we wouldn't know about them. So they're difficult to find. You know, you can go scratch around in the dirt and look for spear points and you can find out where Native Americans lived. But if you find old Spanish documents, you can get a lot more information. So teachers, if the students have questions, uh, please feel free to send them to me in chat and I will do my best to answer them. And before I forget, teachers, if you would, this helps me with um, keeping records of, of how many students we reach. Just send me a chat with your name and your school and what grade you're, you're teaching. That will help me. Um, so I see the list of uh, folks. We have, we have about six classes that have joined us this morning, but if you could send me your name, Ms. Stewart, thank you, uh, your school and the, the grade level, that would help me. Um, and then if the students have questions, please feel free to send those to me as chat as well. We have one more museum mystery episode to do with Spanish history. Um, and I can't tell you what that object is because it's a mystery. Um, and then after that, we shift over to Native American um, Heritage Month. So the second quarter, we'll be doing mystery objects for Native Americans, one of my favorite subjects. Okay, I see so, some questions coming in. Do they break easily? Um, they don't break very easily. It's like hard plastic, but they do wear out. I guess the old paper was kind of rough and it would wear down the, the, the nib or the point of the pen and you would have to retrim it with, with a little knife to, to make your point sharp again. And as you resharpen it each time, the quill would get a little shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually it would be too short and be a little stubby thing and you'd kind of throw it away and get a new one. So they didn't really break as much as they would wear out. And I guess it depends on how much writing you would do also. Okay, let me see, I have some more questions. Did they use different colors of ink? I don't think so. I think most of the ink that I've seen in the old uh, documents and doing research about this on the internet or looking at old books on Spanish um, history, pretty much all of the ink was black. Uh, and I think that has to do with how they made it. Um, did Abe Lincoln use a quill pen? 
Yes, uh, Abe Lincoln would have used a quill pen. Right about the time of the Civil War, 1860s, that was when they were shifting from quill pens over to the metal quill pens that you would dip. So um, Abe Lincoln would have used a quill pen and maybe later toward the Civil War, he might have used a steel, a metal pen, but he would have grown up using a quill pen for sure. All right, let me look. Where do you buy the ink? Ah, well, you can buy India ink at um, any kind of a craft store. They might even sell it in like the craft aisle at Walmart or places like that. It's called India ink. And the thing to know about India ink is if you get it on you, it's going to stay for a little while. It's permanent. It's not like the Sharpie where they say it's permanent, but it's not permanent. India ink is permanent. Um, so teachers for your uh, homemade quill pen activities uh, in the classroom, I would suggest watered down paint. It's a lot easier to get off. So um, India ink, you can buy in stores and it. I've seen it in powder, but typically it's in a jar. Okay. Did they break easily? A blank in. Did they use different colors of ink? Nope. India ink is black. Where can you find one? If you're talking about a quill pen, you might be able to find some big craft feathers and make your own quill pen. I think a turkey, goose, swan, any large feather should work. And the key is to get it nice and hollow and sharp and then cut a little slit. Okay, ah, here is my favorite question. Um, how do they make the ink? Where does the ink come from? I was hoping somebody would ask that. Ink is a very important part of the process because you can have the best pen and the best ink well, but if you don't have good ink, it won't work, right? So India ink, <clears throat> excuse me, was actually, we think, invented in China or somewhere in the Far East, probably at least 2000 years ago, maybe longer, because the Romans were using India ink about 2000 years ago. So yeah, the Chinese probably invented it maybe 3000 years ago. They call it India ink because by the time the people in Europe were getting India ink, it was coming through India. That's where the trade routes went. So the traders would put stuff on ships and camels and they would go all over the world and they would cut through India. So the trade routes that brought the Europeans the ink went through India, they call it India ink, but it actually was coming from China. The way that they make it is they take the black soot, which is kind of like smoke residue, if you've ever um, had a campfire and you put a, you know, a, a kettle over the fire and it gets that black soot on the outside of the kettle, that's what you scrape off and it's like a fine black powder. And they would mix that with some other things uh, and add water to, to liquefy it. And that's how they make India ink. It's made with uh, black soot, which is kind of a byproduct of smoke. The soot is the black part that like gathers on the inside of a chimney. Now, um, they would also, once they made it, they would dry it out and make it into little blocks and they would trade it in little dry blocks. It would look almost like a, like a big black crayon. And when you got that <clears throat> dry block of India ink, you would, you would break off a little chunk and grind it into a fine powder and add water and make the ink uh, liquid form again. Um, so, Let's see, I see another question. This is a good one. Can they use ink from a squid? I suppose they could, but it would be tricky. Here's why. First of all, you gotta catch the squid, right? And then you gotta kind of squeeze the squid and get the ink to come out. And then you have to capture the ink in a little jar and the squid's not gonna be very happy at all. It's not a nice thing to do to a squid because they're just swimming around the ocean, not hurting anybody. Um, and then you would probably wanna release the squid. And then you've got this little container of squid ink, which I don't think would last on paper. It's not going to be permanent like India ink. And think about how many poor squids you would have to go and catch. So I don't think it's practical. No, no for the squid ink. Big fail on the squid ink, sorry. We'll stick with India ink. You can build fires all day long and collect soot, right? That's a lot easier than catching squids. All right, but that is a good question. All right, let me see. Do we have other questions? Does the sand have to be hot in order to make the bottom sharp? No, the sand, the warm, hot, the warm, dry sand or hot, dry sand, pretend like my hand is the sand. You put the pen down into the sand 
And the sand is really only intended to make this part of the feather dry and hard. So it's really just to harden the tip and to dry it out. The way that you make it sharp is if we pretend like this is a little knife, you would take a little knife and, and cut the end of the quill to make it sharp. So the sand doesn't make it sharp, but it makes it hard. And then you would use a knife to sharpen it. That's a good question though. Okay, let me see if we have other questions. When exactly did they start using quill pens? Well, we don't know exactly. There is uh, some artwork from the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, um, that show quill pens in the artwork, kind of like the painting of the scribe. And so just after Roman times, probably 15, 1600 years ago, the Romans were around 2000 years ago, or they're still around, but the Roman Empire was there 2000 years ago. So probably, and the Romans were using the little uh, um, wooden reeds. And then a few hundred years after the Romans, people figured out they could use quills. And that's where you start seeing pictures of quills and artwork. So probably 15 to 1700 years ago, people figured out how to make uh, feather quills. And they used them up until like the Civil War in the 1860s. So, okay. Where would they have gotten the ink from in the past? We talked about that. The squid, we talked about that. Okay, I think I've answered all of your questions. We're about two minutes past 8.30, so I've actually rambled. It was the squid question that pushed us over. Teachers, thank you for joining us. Students, I hope you found the quill pens interesting. My joke of the week is if you don't like homework, which you should because it makes you smarter, but if you don't like homework, you can blame the Spanish explorers because they brought reading and writing to Florida. Ha ha. No offense to the Spanish explorers. That's just a joke. Remember, before the Spanish explorers came, we did not have reading and writing in Florida. All right, that's it for this week. I hope to see you guys in two weeks for our last museum mystery object for Spanish history. And then after that, we'll shift over to Native Americans, which will be great. And I hope you all have a great rest of the week. I see thank yous. You're welcome. Students, work hard and learn a lot. That's what my mom used to say. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good week.